friends. What's up? So everybody in my Instagram stories said something about, yes, to historic mac and cheese. Thanks for participating in the poll. So I'm going to go ahead and test drive this mac and cheese. I have a lecture to give about macaroni and cheese later on this month, and I have to test a couple of different recipes. So I'm going to start with the earliest one. This is from the Virginia Housewife, which is Mary Randolph's cookbook from 1762. So just really quick, a little bit of history about macaroni and cheese. Macaroni, or rather noodles and cheese, pasta and cheese, has been a combination for millennia, literally. But in the 18th century, it was very popular in Italy because the first um, machines that were used to die cut pasta were invented and started to be used. In fact, Thomas Jefferson had one shipped to Monticello. He not only bought cases and cases and cases of pasta to be sent back to Virginia when he was in France, he actually bought a pasta making machine as well. Now, if you knew that Thomas Jefferson was the guy that is attributed with bringing back macaroni and cheese to America, you'd be half right. He was kind of the influencer that popularized it, but this recipe is from 1762. It was already here. People already knew about it. And of course, Thomas Jefferson, well, he was the influencer that liked it, but he wasn't making it. He sent his enslaved man, James Hemings, brother of Sally Hemings, to school in France, to culinary school, to learn how to cook, among many other things, macaroni and cheese. So, in the 18th century, macaroni is kind of a buzzword used for any kind of pasta, and we still see that today. Check out this bag. It's rigatoni that I'm using, a tube pasta, because that would have been around in the 18th century. But if you take a look at the bag, it says macaroni product. Macaroni product. It's made from semolina flour, so, and it's bronze die cut, just like in the 18th century. So it's fair to say that even if they didn't have ridged tube pasta like this rigatoni, um, they definitely had tubed pasta. And then there was also noodles or vermicelli, which was anything that was long and thin and cut with a knife. We call it spaghetti today, fettuccine. There's literally hundreds of different kinds of pasta. But in the 18th century, macaroni was something like this. Vermicelli was the long noodles. So let's dive in. So this recipe, it's this one right here on the page. And I know that looking at a computer screen uh, in a video is kind of rough, so I'll read it to you. It says, boil as much macaroni as you will fill your dish in milk and water till quite tender. Drain it on a sieve, sprinkle a little salt over it, put a layer in your dish, then cheese and butter as in the polenta and bake it in the same manner. So to make polenta is this one up here. And the relevant part says, put on it slices of cheese and on that a few bits of butter, then mush cheese and butter until the dish is full. So we're mixing the cheese and the butter into the macaroni right in the dish. And then put on top of it thin slices of cheese and butter. Put the dish in a quick oven, 20 or 30 minutes will bake it. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna start by boiling our macaroni in milk and water, which is not something that most people do today. I usually boil pasta just in water. So we're gonna start by boiling in water and milk until it's tender, and then we're gonna mix it right in the dish, put some slices of cheese and butter on top, and just for your information, a quick oven is in modern terms about 375 to 400 degrees. The recipe on the bag to properly boil this pasta calls for six quarts of liquid, six quarts of water for each pound of pasta, and that bag is a pound. So instead of six quarts of water, we're going to do a two to one ratio, four quarts of water and then a quart of milk, which I've got here. Because this 18th century recipe doesn't give those proportions, so we're just going to do a little experimentation. After all, that's what you all are here for, to help me experiment. It seems like a lot of milk, 
but there's no milk that's added into the recipe. There's no bechamel sauce, so who knows? Let's see how it goes. Maybe this is how that flavor gets into the pasta. So we're gonna boil that up and then put the pasta in it. If you're like me, you actually salt your pasta water. We're gonna refrain from doing that this time. Uh, while this is boiling, I'm gonna preheat the oven to probably 400 because that's a temperature that I often bake macaroni and cheese at. And then I'm gonna get a dish out and please excuse my messy stove top here. We had a little spill earlier. Um, the uh, dish isn't supposed to be greased. Is that something that you do? You grease your pan or butter your pan before you bake your mac and cheese casserole? All right, well, the Virginia housewife tells us nothing about that, so we're not gonna do it. We're gonna see what happens. Um, the other thing that you have to think about is that this is a modern oven, of course. In the 18th century, we're talking about putting a dish into a Dutch oven or maybe a bread oven. So something like a beehive or a bread oven would give a cook uh, a little bit more wiggle room in terms of what pan is going in there. But for a Dutch oven, hold on. There are only, there are only so many pans that will go in something like this, right? So if I were making this over a campfire, which I might just start doing because this is a 1762 recipe, um, I would even consider putting it in a pie plate, one of my deep dish ceramic pie plates or something like that. Something that makes this uh, Dutch oven work like an oven, like it's supposed to. Coals underneath, coals on top, bakes everything from uh, equal distance, top and bottom. So. It's not that hard to translate some historic recipes from the historic into the modern, and this is one of them. Just remember when you're doing it that you have all these wonderful modern things um, that would have been done over an open flame, and somebody would have had to know, the cook or the baker would have had to know when the oven reaches quick oven status, or if using this, when the coals underneath are hot enough to warm this up, bottom and sides, enough so that when a casserole is put in it and the lid is put on it and those same hot coals are put on top, it's going to reach 375 or 400. So there's a lot of skill involved in this. So this cheese is Kerrygold Dubliner, which is a sharp cheese, kind of like a cheddar. Um, interestingly enough, white cheeses were less common in the 18th century. Um, orange cheese was more common. You can see that we have a Kerrygold problem in this house. So <laughs> it's a good problem. <laughs> it's a good obsession. So I am just cutting some thin slices here that we're going to lay across the top of our dish. Yeah, that's where our Mac's going to go. So just prepping some stuff while we wait for the water and milk to boil. Some time later. <laughs> okay, so we are boiling all of a sudden. Oh. <laughs> Did you ever have a pasta bag break on you in a weird way? All right, so this entire pound of pasta is going into this boiling milk and water. And it's 
flattering me and my darling cameraman. Sorry. Okay. So we're in there. Now, the instructions on the bag say to boil for 11 to 12 minutes, 11 minutes for al dente, 12 if you want it a little more tender, and it says to stir occasionally, which, to be honest with you, I think is a good idea. Even though Mary Randolph didn't indicate that, she did not indicate a lot of things, like how much cheese or butter to use at any given time. So, I think... Given the fact that we have boiling milk here, which can potentially scald in the pan, um, I'm definitely going to give these the occasional stir. Plus, it really just foamed up a moment ago, and I don't want that to happen again, but it does need to boil. So, I'm not sure about our proportions of milk and water here. That's kind of one of the fun things. Huh, quick oven. That's kind of one of the fun things about experimenting with historical recipes, because for as much measurement as they do give you, there's plenty of measurement that they don't. So boil your pasta in milk and water. Well, what the heck does that mean? I mean, it's fun to find out. If you have the means, you may as well buy some milk and buy some pasta and give it a try with different ratios. And again, I appreciate y'all being interested in this because this is a test drive. I got to see how it turns out so that I can have something that's at least edible for <laughs> the lecture participants. Now, it's pretty hard to mess up noodles and cheese, so I'm fairly certain that it's going to be delicious either way. Um, but just in case disaster happens, it's good to test it out first. So, in case you were wondering how this is being filmed, my fabulous fellow Andrew is holding the camera. Thanks! I'm bribing him with wine, so of course, when things are bubbling away, boiling away, preheating, um, and there's nothing to be done, it's time to open a bottle of wine. So, we're trying out Sebastiani Butterfield Station Chardonnay. Um, if you watch historical cooking videos, Townsend did a fabulous macaroni and cheese video. It's not a baked macaroni and cheese. His recipe is from a little bit later in the 18th century. It's also a wonderful one. He shows you just how to do it. So if you go to YouTube, you can find Townsend's cooking channel and you can see an 18th century stovetop macaroni and cheese rather than one that is boiled and then baked. So. Uh, as we pour out here and wait for our macaroni to boil, um, don't forget to check out Townsend's. He's got an extensive historical cooking channel, and he certainly did not ignore macaroni and cheese. Okay. Hold on. That's pretty good. Okay, so these are tender, so I'm going to take them off the heat, and I'm going to pour them through my sieve, and I'll be right back with the drained macaroni. There's some dirty dishes in my sink, true story, so we're not going to swing the camera over there. I promise I'll be right back. Okay, hang on. All right, so the next step after it's drained is to sprinkle a little salt over it. That's the part that we normally do beforehand. I'm going to give that a little stir. And then, to put a layer in our pan, I think pretty much I'm going to put the whole thing in here. Uh, I might need a bigger pan. What do you think? Sorry. I feel like that might be too big. I'm not sure. Let's go with the smaller one and try it out. Oh, I should have gone with the bigger one. Time to transfer. You know, 
Usually I am much better with spatial relations than that. That's kind of embarrassing. I just didn't want to believe that one pound of cooked pasta fit a large two-quart casserole, but here we are. Okay, so now the next instruction was to stir in slices of cheese. I've just done little baby cubes here. The same thin slices that I'm going to put on top and then just cut into smaller chunks because I want them to melt through the pasta. And again, <laughs> there's no instruction in the Virginia housewife for how much. Mary Randolph just says, hey, slice some cheese in there, put some butter in there. And we'll see how she goes. So, that's what we're going to do. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, gosh, Karen, it's kind of hard to mess up macaroni and cheese. And I'd argue that you're probably right. But, you never know. Sometimes historic recipes have a penchant for tricking us when we think something should be easy. In fact, I bet that this recipe takes a lot more butter than I think it does, just judging from the amount of pasta that's in here. I should probably put more cheese inside the pasta as well. But first we're going to do as instructed with the polenta. We're going to mush it together, and that's written in there kids, mush it. We're going to mush it together and see how it goes. And of course, the heat of the pasta is going to melt the butter, and it's going to start to melt the cheese a little bit. So I did end up chunking up and putting in the rest of that block of cheese. One of the things about using a white cheese with white pasta is that it's actually kind of hard to tell my distribution in here. So um, it is macaroni and cheese, so the more the merrier, right? So I've stirred it in. I did put a little bit more butter in, but not too much. It really didn't need much more. You can see the pasta is glistening, so it's pretty well covered. So now we're going to take our thin slices of cheese per Mary Randolph's instruction. What's really interesting about the Virginia housewife is that Mary Randolph was a plantation mistress, so she was an enslaver, and as was often the practice in the 18th century, she was writing down the recipes, but I can almost guarantee you that she wasn't responsible for cooking them. She certainly had her enslaved community, probably the women, cooking and doing this work. So she was just writing it down for posterity. Um, all right, there we go. What do you think? I think it looks all right. So our oven is already set. It's on 400. So oven is quick. Ready? Here we go. All right, bye-bye, little mac and cheese. We'll see you in 25 minutes. Three seconds. All right. Are you ready? I wasn't ready. I didn't have my... <laughs> Here we go. Come on. Can you hear it sizzling? Look at that brown on top. That's nice. Ooh. All right. So that actually looks 
Pretty cheesy. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Is the mic picking up the butter sizzling? I hope so. Okay, so I'm going to spoon a little bit of this out onto our two dishes here. Now, I used a glazed ceramic casserole, which in theory um, would be a container that in the 18th century um, an enslaved cook or a home cook would have used. And this recipe isn't really sticking. It's sticking to my spoon, but not so much to the dish. So I think that that is attributable to all the butter. Yeah, I can see butter pooling in the bottom of this dish, and it's probably not just butter. It's probably grease from the macaroni and cheese itself, from the cheese. So it's really simple. There aren't that many ingredients to it. It actually looks pretty nice, and I expect it's going to taste like Italian pasta, butter, and cheese. Alright, so the thing about this casserole is that it doesn't, because it doesn't have a bechamel sauce, because it doesn't have any sauce that was incorporated, um, it's essentially pasta with some cheese melted through it. And what it reminds me of just looking at it are some of those nights when I come home really late from work, I'm by myself in the house, I just boil up some pasta really quick and throw some butter and some cheese into my bowl and let it all melt together. That's essentially what we've got here. So I think that this recipe is really going to depend on the quality of the pasta that you have and the quality of the butter and cheese. So quality of ingredients. But let's give it a try. That's exactly what it tastes like. Yummy. Boiled pasta. I really like the crust on top. It's been baked, so it's a little crunchy. But that's really what I taste. I taste the nice pasta. I taste the butter. And I taste the sharp flavor of the cheese. Um, so there you go. I actually think that this is pretty successful. You can come and see here sort of the grease that is in the bottom of the dish. So this is probably not like a diet friendly dish. But it's yummy. We baked this for 25 minutes at 400 degrees. This is one pound of pasta, which fills a massive casserole dish. Um, and I would say probably, probably maybe a couple of teaspoons of butter. Really not very much butter at all. And a heck ton of cheese. This was <laughs> probably a cup or maybe even two of cheese. That big block that we were using, that you saw me slicing, all of that ended up in or on this casserole. So um, that was originally a two pound block. There was probably three quarters of a pound of it left. Um, so yeah, we're gonna go enjoy mac and cheese and some Chardonnay now. And I hope you've enjoyed this and it inspired you to look into some historical recipes, maybe pick the shorter ones, maybe pick the simpler ones with fewer ingredients, and just give it a whirl. Some of them are tough, but this one, not that hard. And now we've got mac and cheese for days. So, all right. I'll see you next time. Bye.